So, it happened in the most recent episode of JJK, that being last week's episode, not today's episode. I'm aware this is releasing on a Thursday. One of the most grueling, disgusting, and downright hideous moments in all of JJK's manga was finally animated. And I'm not talking about Miwa giving up her ability to swing a sword just for it to be caught by Kenjaku and snapped, or Chozo fighting for his life to battle against Kenjaku and ultimately failing. No. We're talking about the Mei Mei scene. The Mei Mei scene that manga readers have known about for years. One of the most dreaded and least looked forward to anime adaptation scenes we've seen in years. And in fact, the dread for this scene was so incredibly existential and wide reaching that almost every single manga reader who's picked up JJK hoped that Mappa would just skip it. Boy oh boy, did they not skip it. In fact, they, for some reason, made it the best animated part of the entire episode. Then again, we were fools to assume that there would be anything even remotely resembling moral upstanding coming from MAPPA Studios. But regardless of what we as manga readers wanted, we got the scene. And the response to the scene has been a relatively mixed bag. See, there are those who are having the incredibly rational response of, Oh, why would they do that? While there are others who are dealing with it in a slightly different way. That is to say that there are others who have tried to rationalize this scene, which is a fairly standard thing to do when affronted with trauma that you're not entirely sure how to pave over. See, because when humans are faced with inconsolable trauma, they really tend to go, one of two ways. The first way is the way that I usually subscribe to, and that is suppression. If you don't remember it happening, did it ever even really happen? Well, the second route isn't something that I necessarily subscribe to, but it is something I understand, which is justification, which means trying to make sense of a relatively senseless situation to make it easier to digest. But Nick, what scene am I talking about here? Well, for those of you who haven't seen the scene, congratulations. And for those of you who have suppressed it already, I'm sorry, but the scene that I'm talking about features Mei Mei, one of the side characters of Jujutsu Kaisen, featured naked in bed with her underaged brother. And while that is weird enough as is, the scene also features Mei Mei saying things like, oh, should we stay in bed all day? I know using your technique wears you out. Because Mei Mei and Yu Yu, her little brother, who is definitely not 18, not that that would help anything, use Yu Yu's technique to escape the Shibuya incident to Malaysia, specifically Kuala Lumpur. And as somebody who's wanted to go to Kuala Lumpur their entire life, this has mired the city a little bit for me. All in all, the scene is horrible, gross, and disgusting, and has no place existing in such an incredible universe. And yet, MAPPA decided to give it the most 4K animation they've decided to give anything in this entire season. But like I said, people's response to the scene has been a mixed bag. While some understand that there's no possible reason, regardless of how good it might sound, but a naked adult woman in bed with her child brother. Others have begun to argue that this scene is pivotal for the plot of Jujutsu Kaisen, and it's that that I want to talk about today. Because today, we're talking, is it time to stop watching Jujutsu Kaisen? Before we get to talking about anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like the idea of me breaking down what happened in your favorite anime and manga, you're going to love my anime podcast, Talk is Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you just want to look like somebody who keeps up to date with all things anime and manga, go ahead and meander into my merch store, TakuzAnonymous.net, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. So everybody, I'd like to open today's class by asking one simple question. Where do we all stand on the naked woman laying in bed with her underaged brother? Is it, is it that it's bad? Because if it's not, then you don't get to attend this class. Because it is bad. Regardless of how you justify it, it's bad. It doesn't matter that it's an older woman as opposed to an older man, and it doesn't matter that Mei Mei is incredibly sexy. It's wrong. There's no two ways about it. I'm not even gonna go the incredibly basic route of, oh, imagine if the shoe was on the other foot and Mei Mei was a man as opposed to a woman and their little sibling was actually a little girl. Because that happens in anime as well. Now, would it have been way less justified if Mei Mei was a man? Absolutely. But the situation is equally bad regardless of the genders involved and what roles they play. It's illegal, it's gross, and it has no place in anime and manga. And I've always been very outspoken about the fact that this has no place in anime and manga, especially today. It's a core tenet of this page, it's a core tenet of who I am as a person, as I believe that any instances of essay, incest, or pedophilia should be left out of anime and manga unless they specifically serve a purpose. Yes, those topics can be broached in anime and manga. Many any anime and manga have pulled them off masterfully. But when including topics like that, make them mean something. However, unfortunately, these three topics have existed in anime and manga 
for a long time. And while I do genuinely believe that anime and manga are heading in the correct direction as these three topics are brought up less and less and less, as tropes like the overtly horny main character who gropes every woman he comes across have slowly but surely been weeded out, it's moments like this may scene scene that make us realize that these tropes are still very much a part of the anime world, and therefore it's the job of people like me to say, hey, could it not be? And I'm going to keep doing that regardless of how popular the anime or manga is. And in fact, the more popular the anime or manga is with scenes like this, the louder I'm going to yell. Because the popular anime and manga can lead the charge for future generations of anime and manga artists to show that you don't need tropes like this to be successful in their world. And tropes like this can be cut out of anime and manga in their entirety. Because tropes like this mire incredible universes. Look at characters like Meliodas or Rudy Greyrat. Main characters of expansive, impressive, and beautifully laid out worlds. With unique power systems, interesting side characters, fantastic character development, who both unfortunately mire the experience of diving headlong into that universe because we have to see that universe through their eyes. And while JJK doesn't fall into that trapping because Yuji is an incredible, thoughtful, and fantastic main character, moments like this show us that JJK, what is thought to be the leader in terms of how manga should be written in the new gen, is not immune to the usage of terrible tropes. And just like with Rudy or Meliodas, there's gonna be people who justify these tropes being involved in JJK's story. And just like with Rudy or Meliodas, I vehemently disagree. However, I agree even more when it comes down to JJK. Because while Mushoku Tensei and Seven Deadly Sins are popular, they're not JJK popular. While Mushoku Tensei might be the most popular isekai out right now, and Seven Deadly Sins was really good for two seasons, neither of them have ever come close to rising to the level at which JJK currently sits. And to go one step further than that, nobody looks at Mishuku Tensei or Seven Deadly Sins as exactly how women should be written in the new gen. As people often look at characters like Utahime or Nobura as the golden standard for how women should be written in new gen anime and manga. Independently powerful women who aren't reliant on the men around them and are able to be motivated outside of the motivations of the men around them, all while still managing to hold on to their femininity. And really when it comes down to writing women that are individually power and singularly motivated, Gege Katami has crushed it. He truly has set the golden standard for the next generation of anime and manga artists to show how women should be treated in modern day stories. Characters like Nobara and Maki shine on their own. And while technically one can make the contrary an argument to say that Gege is simply showing that Meme has the ability to be just as predatorial as any man, I don't think that's a category we need women to run up the score in. And thus, while if you've read any of Mushoku Tensei or Seven Deadly Sins, you'll have given up on the main characters pretty much straight from the beginning, seeing the JJK universe, a universe which seemed so dedicated to the modernization of how a story should be told in Japan as it pertains to anime or manga, fall into the trappings of the 80s and 90s anime and manga is just way more disappointing, as I had already given up on Mashiku Tensei and Seven Deadly Sins a long time ago, so to see them fall into old tropes that no longer are necessary in modern day storytelling, it's just not all that disappointing. It's like being a Browns fan and watching them squander away a lead or a good season. You're used to it, you're desensitized by it, and therefore you're less disappointed. But the JJK instance is a bit like being a Patriots fan for the last 20 years and watching them win Super Bowl after Super Bowl after Super Bowl, but nowadays they're trotting out Bailey Zappi and you just wish you could fast forward to the end of the fourth quarter. But I guess fortunately for JJK as a story, it's incredibly popular. And if people are willing to justify the actions of Meliodas, Rudy Gray, Rad, or even Mineta and MHA, JJK, a story which now has more concurrent readers than all three of these stories possibly combined. Seven Deadly Sins isn't doing much to help those numbers, and technically Mushuku Tensei is already over. Has plenty of people coming out to justify this scene as necessary for the plot of Jujutsu Kaisen. But how is this scene being justified, you ask? Well, there's really one of two ways. The first, I wouldn't necessarily call a justification, but more of an explanation. An explanation that I myself have tried to make. In fact, recently on my podcast, Utaku's Anonymous, when me and my co-host, Danny Mata, were talking about this scene, I tried to find a way to explain it to him that would possibly explain why Mei Mei and Yu Yu would end up in bed together. Or at least I tried to give Danny the theory that I cobbled together over the last couple of years of trying to figure out why the hell this scene was even made in the first place. See, because my co-host Danny hasn't read the manga. And thus, this scene was a surprise. Well, not that much of a surprise. I told him it was coming, but 
you get it. So in regards to this scene, I said that Mei Mei probably had Yu Yu use his curse technique, which may or may not be teleportation. We don't know what Yu Yu's curse technique is, but it's theorized that it's teleportation. Now, the reason that we believe that Yu Yu's curse technique is teleportation is because Mei Mei says that she used Yu Yu's curse technique to get to Malaysia. And when you consider how fast Mei Mei and Yu Yu were able to get to Malaysia from Shibuya, especially considering the fact that public transit has been shut down for the next couple of hours, it seems fairly obvious that Yu Yu's technique was somehow able to get Mei Mei and Yu Yu to Malaysia. Thus, the most popular theory pretending to use technique is that he's able to teleport himself and possibly a couple other people to marked locations. Te Bo Yu Yu is able to teleport himself and all of his possessions. It's a possibility that when he teleports other people, he can't take their possessions. And thus, Yu Yu teleported himself and Mei Mei to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur specifically. And because he wasn't able to teleport her possessions, aka her clothes, she showed up naked. It's also a possibility that Yu Yu has some kind of Minecraft Steve ability, where he's able to teleport back to wherever he last slept, which would explain why they ended up in bed. And since we understand that Yu Yu has more cursed energy than Mei Mei because of the fight that they have against a small pox curse, the idea that Yu Yu has the ability to teleport himself and Mei Mei thousands of miles away isn't crazy, especially when we consider the fact that teleportation is absolutely a thing in JJK. Gojo can do it, and Gojo can do it from incredibly far distances away and with incredible precision. And thus, there's a possibility that the real reason that we never see Yu Yu fight in the first place is because his only technique allows him to escape. And therefore, technically, if that's how Yu Yu's curse technique works, then boom, we figured it out. We can answer how Mei Mei and Yu Yu ended up in this situation. But here's the thing. Explaining and understanding how it happened in universe does not justify the trope's existence. Oh, Nick, are you gonna be upset about that? That's just how his technique works. Yeah. Uh. Do you know he's not a real character, right? Like, we're not talking about how a gun can only shoot bullets straight. We're talking about a made-up character with a made-up technique. Because while I can sit here and go, oh, Meliodas gropes Elizabeth every chance he gets because they've been together for thousands of years through countless reincarnations. But that doesn't make Meliodas doing it any better. Like, yeah, of course, there's a possible in-universe explanation for why characters act certain ways. But, uh... You realize there's always a guy with a pen making them that way? And even if you wanted to go with the justification via an in-universe explanation, while Yu's technique does put them in that bed and possibly strips Mei Mei of all of her clothes, Mei Mei's response to the situation is gross and uncalled for, as she seems almost excited by the prospects of spending all day in bed with her little brother while wearing no clothes. And not to mention, if you want to go with an in-universe explanation as to why one of them had to end up naked in bed, you could argue that, oh, this is just an introduction to how you use technique works, because it's going to get used later in the manga in a more important context. We got to iron out how the technique works now. We got to plant seeds of interest so that they can pay off in 200 chapters. Yu Yu hasn't been back in the manga since this moment, and we still don't know his technique. Oh, and by the way, yes, I know it's oui oui. I just hate saying oui oui. Sounds like a French pig. Sorry, I was sweating. We don't know if he's allowed to teleport multiple people. We don't know if his teleportation is contingent on loving the person he's teleporting. And we definitely don't know if his teleportation technique requires clothes or not. What we do know for sure is that Gagagatami could have very easily made his teleportation technique have nothing to do with his adult sister being naked in bed with him. And we definitely know that we could have gone without his adult sister implying that they're gonna bang all day. See, because as it currently stands, while there might be theories as to why this moment happened, there's still no in-universe justification. And there technically can never be. Unless part of his technique also somehow turns his sister into somebody who really wants to bang their underage brother. But once again, that's not a justification. Because why would his technique work like that? If we're being entirely real, there's no way this scene can be justified from an in-universe perspective. But what about an outside of universe explanation? A perspective that looks down at JJK from a bird's eye view. Our perspective. The narrative and plot undertones perspective. Well, could you justify the moment from that perspective? Maybe. People are definitely trying. So the other key way that people are trying to justify this scene's existence is that this scene is meant to compare Mei Mei to Nanami, or more specifically, use Mei Mei as a foil to Nanami. And I have to admit, this is kind of fun to talk about. And this has been talked about ever since this moment was penned and released in the manga. And people believe that this moment was included to show us just how different Mei Mei and Nanami, who are both in very similar positions, truly were. That is to say that Nanami and Mei Mei, while they could have been very similar characters, both decided to go about things in the exact opposite way of each other, even though their circumstances were very similar. But what do I mean by that? 
Let's get into it. When it really comes down to it, Nanami and Mei Mei are some of the only people that we see that have a foot in both the Jujutsu Society and Standard Society. That is to say that they have one foot in the Jujutsu Society and one foot in the capitalistic society of Japan. The way that they approach this split life is very different from each other. Well, Nanami left the Jujutsu world to go and get a day job because she didn't want to die like Haibara and all of his friends. Mei Mei decides to keep one foot in both realms simultaneously and thus allowing herself to keep one finger on the pulse of everything happening in the Jujutsu Society society and another finger on the pulse of everything happening within capitalistic society, making Mei Mei kind of the mole of the upper echelon of Japan to know everything that's happening in the Jiu-Jitsu society and know whether or not they should invest in Japan or pull their investments out of Japan. So Nanami enters regular society to escape the Jiu-Jitsu society, while Mei Mei enters capitalistic society to exploit Jiu-Jitsu society. Escape and exploitation. And while one of them is torn between these two worlds, Nanami, the other actively chooses to be a part of both of them. Mei Mei. While Nanami uses the outside world as an escape from the horrors that laid in his past, Mei Mei revels in those horrors as they're a way to increase her financial gains. On top of this, after Nanami spends a certain amount of time working at a day job, he realizes that his true calling in life is to be a jujitsu sorcerer. And thus he returns to the dangers of his previous life because he knows that's where his duties lay. And thus that is to say that Nanami abandons normal society to go help in the jujitsu society. But Mei Mei does the exact opposite. See, during the Shibuya incident, Mei Mei decides to run away to Kuala Lumpur. And the first thing that she's focused on after abandoning the Shibuya incident is covering her own capitalistic gains. And thus, in this moment, Mei Mei is abandoning the Jiu-Jitsu society for normal society capitalism. But their allegiances and how they treat them aren't the only ways that these two are dissimilar. Nanami's cursed technique, the three-sevenths technique, requires that he be up close and personal against anybody he wants to fight. However, Mei Mei's crow cursed technique allows her to hang back and use crows to observe people or even use crows to attack people. And on top of this, Mei Mei's most powerful cursed technique ability is her crow suicide attack, where she sacrifices the life of one of her crows to use as essentially a homing rocket. And thus, Mei Mei's most powerful cursed technique attack requires the sacrifice of another. However, on the other side of things, one could argue that the most powerful and impactful thing that Nanami ever does is sacrifice himself for Yuji, which shows that one of them is selfish while the other is truly selfless. And in no better place this displayed than in the Shibuya incident. You see, because when the going got tough, Mei Mei abandoned her comrades. But when the going got tough for Nanami, he doubled down. Nanami, after getting the Harvey Dent treatment from Jogo, decided to continue his fight because he understood that the more transfer Transfigured humans and cursed spirits that he was able to kill, the less chance that those cursed spirits and transfigured humans would be able to kill his juniors. And thus, Nanami doubled down during the Shibuya incident to protect the children he loved. While on the other side of the coin, Mei Mei's abandonment not only shows how she uses the child she loves, but also shows how she grooms him. And thus, people say that Mei Mei represents Jujutsu society and how it takes children and grooms them into perfect little child soldiers who you're able to manipulate and exploit. And thus, the Jujutsu society is greedy, self-centered, and exploitative, while Nanami, on the other hand, is supposed to represent what the Jiu-Jitsu society should be, selfless, caring, and protective of those who are most vulnerable. And Nanami does live up to these three tenets more than possibly anybody else in the entire story, as Nanami, when he tries to run away from the issues of the Jiu-Jitsu society, sees that cursed spirits aren't going anywhere, and that by turning his tail and running from problems, he's only allowing cursed spirits to hurt more people, and thus his cowardice or indifference to the problems of the world around him is only causing more misery. And honestly, I love that. I love Nanami being the golden representation of what the Jiu-Jitsu society should be and Mei Mei being exactly what it is. Because thematically it makes sense, narratively it makes sense, and it makes even more sense when you consider the fact that Nanami's selflessness is actually what gets him killed, while Mei Mei's selfishness is what's kept her alive. And when you compare that to every other character arc throughout JJK, you'll see that the Jiu-Jitsu society is run by the selfish because they're the only people who survive. So them as foil characters meant to be physical representations of what their society could be and what their society is is just chef's kiss good except for the child predation because boy oh boy is there about a billion ways that you can show that Mei Mei is exploiting children that aren't her literally being a pedophile and not even just the pedophile, but like a sleek and sexy and mysterious pedophile whose victim is too young to understand that they're being groomed, used, and abused. And here's the thing, this is gonna sound absolutely insane, but it's not like there shouldn't be sexual assault in media. 
There should be. Sexual assault, pedophilia, incest are things that happen. Do we wish they didn't happen? Absolutely. But because they are things that happen, there's human stories revolving around those topics. And those stories should be told. And survivors of those stories should feel represented by those stories. And here's an even crazier thing. Not every story of SA, incest, or pedophilia should be a story about overcoming it and surviving. Because a lot of victims of those kinds of things don't end up as survivors. And those stories need to be told too. So I'm not sitting here on my high horse or my soapbox saying that we should never have these things in media. Because objectively, some of the most gorgeous, gripping, and well-told stories of all time include these things. But in ways that matter. Take Berserk, for example. There is so much essay in Berserk, and a lot of that is because of when Berserk was written. And a fair amount of the essay in Berserk is unnecessary. There are a lot of ways to convey, oh, that character's evil outside of having them essay Casca. Looking directly at you, Walt. However, throughout the story in Berserk, Guts unfortunately undergoes a ton of essay. And those experiences molds the character that he is. He's standoffish, he hates being touched, and he's incredibly distrustful of anybody who tries to get near him, be they physically or emotionally trying to get near him. And any of these moments where Guts is going through these horrific events are some of the most impactful and serious moments in the entirety of Berserk. They're not just one-off, haha, wasn't that so silly that my adult sister was naked in bed with me in underaged boy moments. Because when these things happen in Berserk, they have long-lasting consequences. Both the Casca and Guts, they are gripping, horrible, and entirely serious moments that leave scars on some of the strongest characters ever betrayed in manga. Guts, a literal mountain of a man doesn't like being touched because of his childhood. It's humanizing. It shows that anybody, regardless of what they look like, can be scarred by horrific past events. And Mei Mei and Wee Wee got none of that. It's a weird, short, unnecessary throw-in that adds nothing to the plot and takes a lot from it. Meime could have exploited her little brother in a million different ways to make her a foil to Nanami. And technically, prior to this moment, she already was, as she had him carry her stuff. She had him release his cursed energy in the smallpox cursed spirit domain expansion, the latter of which could have very easily killed him. All things that Nanami would never do to the likes of Yuji or Megami or Nobara. And thus, the president that Meime is worse to children than Nanami was already set. So to all of the Mashuka Tensei fans who comment on every single one of my videos, Oh, I can't believe this guy who doesn't like Rudy is actually supports JJK with the stuff that Mei Mei has done. Yeah, I super don't support this. I'm calling it out just as hard in JJK as I did in any other universe. But fortunately in JJK, Mei Mei is a side character. And this kind of thing happens once and only once. Can you say the same thing about your universe? No? Yeah, I figured. This moment is gross, uncalled for, and borderline hedonistic. But is it enough reason to stop watching JJK? No. Mei Mei and her little brother all but effectively disappear from the plot after this moment, with Mei Mei just now reappearing in the manga. It's a bad moment. It's a really bad moment. And the author of the story should know it's a bad moment. Every possible author of every possible future story should know this is a bad moment. Every future author should know that this massively detracts from the likability of JJK. And that when it comes down to it, the future of anime and manga doesn't need things like this. Tell the story you want to tell, but never make make topics like incest or pedophilia seem commonplace. Never make it seem like the victim in the situation is enjoying being groomed. And while unfortunately in a lot of circumstances the victim is enjoying being groomed, create consequences for that kind of thing happening. If your story comes across as possibly condoning this type of action, what are you doing? We as manga readers and anime watchers have to be vocal about issues like this. Because without being vocal about issues like this, we'll never see the changes we want to see. But what do you guys think? Do you believe that this scene is justifiable? Tell me in the comments below. And why you guys are down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Ooh, I just know there's a lot of people who aren't going to make it to the end of this video because they're just so darn tootin' mad that I would ever say that it's time to stop watching JJK. But in actuality, if you've watched any of my videos for a long enough time, you'll know sometimes you gotta get people to click.